All right, good morning. I will welcome you here today. Sergeant Tony Turnbull, Sheriff Spokesman, T-O-N-Y-T-U-R-N-B-U-L-L. Uh, today we have several representatives from law enforcement agencies here in Northern California uh, who are going to speak to you today uh, about the 40th anniversary uh, of the East Area Rapist and the connection to the Golden State Killer here in California. I want to start by introducing our first speaker. Um, and. We're going to have four speakers today. Uh, once they are done, we will open it up for questions and answers. Um, the first speaker today will be from Sacramento's field office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Special Agent in Charge, uh, Monica Miller. Thank you, Tony. Mm -hmm. Welcome and good morning. I am Monica Miller, Special Agent in Charge of the FBI Sacramento Field Office. First of all, I'd like to thank Sheriff Jones and the entire Sacramento County Sheriff's Office for hosting this press conference today. We'd also like to thank the following for being here today. Sergeant Paul Belli with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, Anne Marie Schubert, District Attorney for Sac County, Deputy Chief Mike Bray, Sacramento Police Department, United States Air Force Office of Special Investigations Detachment 218, Special Agent Superintendent J.P. LaPre, and Special Agent Amanda Anderson. Also with us is Contra County Contra, sorry, Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office, Paul Mulligan, Chief of Investigators. Sorry about that, Paul. Um, so why are we here today? Today we're going to launch uh, a national campaign to help identify the East Area Rapist, Golden State Killer. This unknown subject terrorized the communities in the greater Sacramento region from 76 to 78 in the East Bay Area in 1979 and Southern California from 1979 to 1986. Due to the number and frequency of burglaries and rapes committed in the Sacramento area, the subject likely resided in or near Sacramento from 1976 to, to 1978. This subject has eluded investigators for over 40 years and the victims and their families deserve justice. So this morning, the FBI has launched a campaign to help the working group generate new tips from the public, and that's where we need your help. We want to identify this killer. Someone may have a piece of information that will help identify the subject. Electronic billboards and a sketch of the subject and a tip line, 1-800-CALL-FBI, has been released nationwide. A web page has also debuted as a central location for information about the crimes, maps of the locations, and interviews from law enforcement involved in the local investigation. Also, the victims and families who still bear emotional scars from their horrific experience. The FBI is also offering a reward of up to $50,000 for information leading to the identification, arrest, and conviction of the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer. So we'd like your help so you can visit the campaign's webpage on the FBI website. You can view the case details there, location maps, sketches, and if the information triggers a memory that may help the working group identify the subject, please submit a tip to 1-800-CALL-FBI or tips.fbi.gov. Thank you. I'm Sheriff Scott Jones. I want to again, once again echo um, what um, Special Agent in Charge Miller talked about and welcome you all here. Um, I want to say that even though these crimes happened four decades ago, and some of them even longer, long before I ever even joined the Sheriff's Department, I can tell you that from the very first days in the department, this case uh, has been talked about, has been worked on. Um, I can tell you that we have detectives that have long since retired that have still very active interest uh, in this case, trying to get more information and more insight. Uh, but it really wasn't until this working group got together uh, five or six years ago and really started connecting the dots on our crimes, not only here, uh, but around the state, and developed some of these leads. And it, and, it, and it helped me realize that it wasn't just the passion of our detectives and our department to solve these horrific crimes, but the similar passions that existed in the other departments where these crimes have occurred. So I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the uh, dedication, the ongoing commitment and support of the detectives who put all these pieces together from all of these agencies, even though these crimes happened long before uh, they ever got in their positions. 
And I also want to make a special thank you to the FBI. Uh, without their help, we would not have the, uh, the ability to expand our plea for the public support um, and the reward money to help us uh, capture the subject and finally, hopefully, put an end um, to these unsolved crimes all up and down the state. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Good morning. My name is uh, Paul Belli, B-E-L-L-I. I'm a sergeant with the Sacramento County Sheriff's Homicide Bureau uh, and uh, the supervisor for cold cases, uh, missing persons, and homicide. Uh, we've already gotten a, a brief overview of the cases. Uh, I'm going to go into them a little bit more in depth uh, related to when they started in uh, Sacramento County. And, and the name, the, the East Area Rapist, I think is uh, something that everybody in Sacramento knows. And, and it was given that name, or he was given that name specifically because of where he began his strikes in June of 1976. Uh, it was all in the eastern portion of uh, Sacramento County and the Ranch Cordova area and if we think back about what was going on in Sacramento at that time we had Mather Air Force Base uh, which is a large base and then we had McClellan Air Force Base as well that was extremely large. So we had uh, quite a bit of people moving in and out of the area which is why this national attention and coverage could be extremely helpful to the case itself. There's a lot of people that were in and out of Sacramento that uh, may know something and may think that, that those cases all got solved and may have no idea that after uh, he was an offender here that he had moved to Contra Costa County uh, where he committed uh, a number of burglaries, sexual assaults there, and then moved down to Southern California where in Santa Barbara he starts offending and at this point he has now turned into uh, a murderer. So uh, he continues his offenses uh, in the Southern California area and ends uh, with his last known attributed crime in 1986 uh, with the murder of Janelle Cruz. So while we've had a, a significant amount of time that has passed since what we believe to be his last known crime, there may be other crimes that uh, have not been attributed to him and that's also another plea uh, for other people that are watching this if he maybe matches something that they've had in their community throughout the United States. So real quick on the working group, um, I can't say enough to, uh, of thanks to the FBI. Uh, back in 2010 when we were able to get some meetings together with agencies and detectives that had cases, whether they had one case or whether they had multiple cases, we all got together and with the help of the FBI, we were able to establish essentially a virtual command post. That way we could uh, share data. Uh, it's all secure. Uh, if there's agencies that have uh, case files, they are able to upload those so that all the detectives could see everything from those particular cases. Uh, it allows us to work collaboratively. Uh, it allows us to find uh, specific individuals that each department is working so that other departments can focus on somebody else because they know that that case is being worked or at least that tip or lead is being worked. So that type of uh, help and collaboration has really uh, kind of, I think, boosted this case in the last five or six years uh, with uh, coming up with all kinds of new ideas about how we're going to try and solve this. Uh, obviously, with the 40th anniversary, uh, this was uh, a time that um, not only can we take to acknowledge the fact that uh, this uh, serial offender was probably one of the most prolific, uh, certainly in California, possibly within the United States, but also to let the victims know that <coughs> we never give up and we are out there looking, we're continuing to look, and we're hoping to move this case forward. Thank you. Morning. I, I, I'd like to just come today from both a professional but also a personal perspective on this case. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I grew up in Sacramento. I grew up in the east area of Sacramento. I come from a large family and there's seven kids in my family. I have three brothers and three sisters. In June of 1976, when the very first assault took place here in Sacramento, I was 12 years old. My sisters ranged from 10 to 16. And it was a time in Sacramento, and for anybody that grew up here, that has lived in this community for more than 40 years, you only need to say three words, and that is the East Area Rapist. 
and everybody remembers it. And the reason why I think it's so memorable is because it was a time in our community in 1976 when we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have cell towers, we didn't lock our doors at night, we rode our bikes around, and the only thing my parents would say at night was just make sure you're home before dark. And that's what we did as kids, it was a time of innocence. And then in June of 1976, that all changed for this community. And anybody that lived here and grew up here knows that. Because it was a time when really, in essence, a community was taken hostage. Um, everybody knew it. It was on the news every night. And the only thing at the time they knew, it was a, it was a white male. That's about it. And for those of us that grew up here, that all changed. My sister, who's four years older than me, was a babysitter in 1976 and was terrified to babysit kids because she was afraid that he was coming. And that's how everybody felt between 1976 and 1979. Everything changed. So I come from that perspective as a personal perspective because I know what it did to this community. And in 1976, when law enforcement took over this investigation, it began what I call now a journey for justice. A journey that has spanned, as the sheriff said, four decades. And then from a professional point of view, I was very fortunate in my career to spend a large percentage of it prosecuting cases involving DNA. And in 2000, with the help of the Sheriff's Department and the help of our crime laboratory, I went to the DA at that time, Jan Scully, and said, hey, this case is now, what, 25 years old. It needs to be solved. Whether or not we can ever prosecute it or not, we need to solve it to bring closure and answers to those victims. And so with the help of the Sheriff's Department, we searched high and low for evidence. And ultimately, through the assistance of Contra Costa County Laboratory, they found that evidence, and that's what made that connection to the, what we now know is one of the most prolific serial killers in the history of this state, if not in this nation. So we now know that that individual who terrorized and took this hostage community has murdered time and time again the one thing I've always said about DNA, whether I was in a courtroom, whether I'm in the community, is, is this. It is the silent witness to the truth. The DNA profile that we have on this case is the witness to the truth. But the simple answer is that we need to put a face to that profile. The answer is out there. After having worked on many cold cases, read many cases, homicides, unsolved, the one lesson that I've always learned is that the answer is out there. It is time for our community to help us, to provide an answer, to put a face to that name. Every time I've been out, whether it's as the elected DA or as a, as a younger prosecutor in the community talking about this case, someone will raise their hand and say, I think it might have been this person, it might have been that person. The answer's out there, we need a name. Because when we match that name to that profile, that journey for justice will come to an end. And so I plead to everybody here in Sacramento, whether you thought you knew a name, you heard something, whatever it is, because we have a team that will provide those answers if you provide the information. So I just ask everybody here, please help us end that journey for justice. So thank you. And we'll open it up for questions, I think, at this time. Right. Do you think triggering this, uh, other than the 40th anniversary, of there any new developments? Was this more sort of a final effort to find this guy as he's aging now after 40 years? Well, I, the 40th anniversary is uh, one of the biggest impetuses for it, but also uh, the collaboration with uh, the FBI, uh, the fact that uh, they've committed to uh, the tip line, to the web tip line, uh, a national campaign uh, with billboards, uh, and uh, also the uh, $50,000 reward. Uh, the one, uh, if you look at the image uh, on the far left, 
Uh, that will be the image that's going to be on the billboards. That comes from a 1978 murder of Brian and Katie Maggiore, which has been attributed to the East Area Rapist. Uh, essentially, Brian and Katie were out walking their dog uh, in Ranch Cordova and uh, were confronted by an individual uh, that uh, through uh, basically an MO link uh, we know to be the East Area Rapist, at which point he chased them into a backyard and he shot and killed both of them uh, on that day. So our best uh, uh, sketch uh, comes from that particular case uh, and that's why we're releasing that one. Uh, this would have been what he uh, most likely looked like uh, back in uh, February of 1978 based on a, a number of witnesses that uh, saw this exchange in the early evening hours. You said the far left, you mean our far right and your far right? Correct, I'm sorry, my far left. Can I ask you a question? These sketches are a lot different from each other. They are, and, and that's not uncommon in uh, in homicide investigations. Um, you know, we we try to pick the best ones uh, that that we can come up with with uh, you know the people that are providing those um, witnesses uh, when they're trying to uh, develop that sketch uh, do absolutely the best that they can, and the artist is trying to interpret exactly what it is that they're providing them. When it comes to MOs, what separates him from any other killer or rapist? I mean, what what's well, uh, he, he was fairly unique. Um, he struck uh, not only single women in their home, uh, he ate, uh, the age ranges were from 13 to 41 years old. Uh, he would also strike uh, women in their home with their children as well. And then also uh, attacking couples. Uh, here in Sacramento, he started with uh, sexual assaults where he would enter the house and tie up the husband uh, and then uh, basically remove uh, the female from the the bedroom and uh, commit his sexual assault, oftentimes eating uh, within uh, the house there. So he was there for many hours at times. Uh, he would also remove items from within the homes. So he would remove uh, uh, jewelry items, identification. Uh, he tended to remove uh, coins, uh, kind of older coins, things of that nature. And it's quite possibly he still has a number of these items that he uh, has has kept over the years uh, as a way to remember uh, the, the crimes and the terror that he inflicted. He used a gun, he, used, uh, he had a knife at times, um, and very often what he would do is he would actually have the, uh, the woman retie the man, and on several occasions he would place the man face down on the ground after he's been tied up, and then place, tr uh, place plates, uh, cups on them, so that uh, he could get some sort of uh, audible clue that had they broken out of their bindings. Can you address the pictures maybe a little uh, more in that the two on the left resemble each other, the one on the right does not. Are these these are just the sketches from the people, but we know by DNA that they're that they're the same guy or so um, the the way that we've linked our cases is uh, in the in Sacramento County we don't have a DNA link to the Contra Costa, but we do have that that MO link. Uh, there's uh, at least two I, two things that we know that he would do. Uh, that we're not ready to share with uh, folks uh, as uh, it's in investigative information. But one of the things he would do is he would bring his own bindings with him, and uh, very often those were shoelaces. Uh, they were tied together. So we know that uh, in Sacramento County, um, the things that he would do here transferred to Contra Costa County. Between the Southern California crimes uh, for the sex assault and murders, uh, they were linked to our Contra Costa crimes, which we know by MO are, are linked to us. Okay, but, the, the, but there's no DNA evidence that, they're, that Contra Costa and Sacramento are related. So again, I'm asking, do we do we know that these are not these crimes are not committed by two different people? Uh, we're please, please we're speaking in the mic. No problem. We're confident that those are not uh, that they were not. Uh, uh, done by two different people based upon the MO and, and it's a very unique MO it it hasn't been repeated uh, since then uh, and, and I'm very confident that it's not two separate people that were operating at the same time doing the same thing. Sergeant, it's not the same thing. Can you talk a little bit about Southern California? How, how do you know it's the same person there? Uh, that's essentially a DNA link because in Southern California um, uh, there are 
there, his first attack in Goleta actually uh, result. It was kind of a botched uh, attempt. So he goes into a home. Uh, they end up breaking free of their bindings, and he loses control of the situation and then runs away. Uh, later, his crime where he uh, sexually assaults and then murders uh, a couple in their home, that is linked by DNA to Contra Costa. So that's how we know that those are uh, specifically linked cases and then linking it back to us as well. Is the belief now that he's out there alive or have you checked, um, could he be in jail for another crime or do you guys believe that he's out there? Uh, so to answer your first uh, uh, question related to jail for other crimes, there is a, a good possibility that um, he was incarcerated for periods of time throughout this. Uh, he obviously engaged in behavior that would possibly get him arrested. Uh, however, he may have been arrested long before DNA, uh, uh, you know, mandatory collections happened. So we wouldn't necessarily have his uh, DNA if he hasn't reoffended. Uh, as far as whether we believe he's alive, uh, there's really no reason reason to believe that he isn't alive. Um, based upon age ranges back in those times, uh, we estimate him, and it's a wide range, to be anywhere from 60 to 75 years old. Uh, he's a white male, um, about five foot nine, uh, and he had uh, blonde or uh, light brown hair. Um, we believe he had either, he was either in the military uh, or ha had a big interest in military or law enforcement training. And uh, he was very proficient with a firearm based upon uh, encounters with him uh, throughout his crime spree and then also with uh, some of his uh, shootings, uh, certainly in the Brian and Katie Maggiore murder. And then, uh, like I said, he may still have items uh, related specifically uh, to uh, these crimes. Were there any victims, possible victims, that, ex that escaped? There were. There were a couple of victims that escaped, uh, not only through his sex assault series, uh, but uh, like I said, also um, two victims that escaped him down in uh, Southern California. Can you talk a little bit about the timeline of uh, what different locations he was at? Can sure. Uh, so um, June uh, 18th is uh, his first known attack here in Sacramento County. Uh, and around all of his sex assaults, uh, we are working to attribute a number of burglaries uh, that occurred. There would be a uh, kind of a burglary cluster, and then there would be a sex assault. So uh, we believe he's responsible for well over uh, 150 burglaries uh, related to these crimes as well. Uh, so then uh, February February 1978 is when we have Brian and Katie Maggiore and uh, at that point he starts to kind of move uh, as far as his offenses. He moves to Davis, uh, Modesto, Stockton and then uh, those are all linked by MO as well and then in October of 1978 he begins offending in the uh, uh, Contra Costa area and he has cases in uh, San Jose, Danville, uh, and Walnut Creek. Uh, he remains there in that uh, East Bay region of uh, of uh, San Francisco and then moves uh, in October of 1979 down to Goleta. They started to experience uh, a cluster of burglaries and then they had the first uh, uh, attempt um, for the sex assault. Uh, and during that attempt he actually talks uh, kind of to himself and it becomes very clear to those two victims that he is going to harm them, which is what prompts uh, them to try and break their bindings and make it out of the house. Uh, in December of 1979, uh, he commits a double murder in Goleta uh, as well. Uh, that's a DNA case. And then March 1980, uh, he moves to Ventura. And then we go to August where he offends in Laguna Nigel. Nigel. Uh, and then February of 1981 is uh, Irvine. And then we have a, a big gap, about five year gap, uh, where um, he uh, then offends in uh, um, 1986. Uh, military records, has there been any, I mean, there's, we've got Sacramento, and then we have Fairfield, we've got the base there, and then down in Southern California. Has there been any help or any way to cross reference their? their uh, military files and possible 
pictures of servicemen? Yes, uh, so that is a, a track that we've been uh, working on for, for many years um, and uh, why we've uh, always had the help of uh, uh, OSI uh, for the Air Force. Uh, we've also enlisted uh, the Navy's uh, assistance uh, investigatively as well uh, and have been trying to track um, two very large bases with uh, people that were coming in and out for training and, and a variety of things like that. So that is uh, one of the um, uh, thought processes that we've had moving forward. Do you think it's possible he could have been a serviceman? It is possible, uh, or uh, a civilian contractor um, somehow attached to that. He could have also just been uh, maybe a, a relative of a service member. Can you talk about why he's called the East Area Rapist? And then I guess now there's this new name, Golden State Killer. So um, <clears throat> East Area Rapist came specifically from the fact that he was operating in eastern uh, Sacramento County, Ranch Cordova area. Uh, and once they developed that there was information that that was a series crime, uh, that was essentially the, the name that he was given here in Sacramento. Uh, as he moved um, to Contra Costa, because we were aware of their crimes and our detectives went down there in an attempt to assist, uh, that name continued with him. Uh, once he stopped in that uh, Northern California region, um, he moves to Southern California. Nobody knew that that was the same offender, and he was given the name of the original Night Stalker, uh, which uh, somewhat confuses it a bit because everybody knows uh, Richard Ramirez as the Night Stalker, uh, and we know that he was arrested for uh, his crimes. So um, his naming kind of makes him lost a little bit um, uh, for, uh, um, I guess, assistance from the public to know who he was. Uh, Michelle Mac McNamara uh, is a writer who became very interested in this case uh, and did a um, uh, an article for LA Magazine and she named him the Golden State Killer and specifically because she felt that uh, people weren't really recognizing the fact that he offends in uh, Northern California and then offends in Southern California and, and the fact that he was all throughout our state. Yeah. I'm confused you said that at the time that they didn't realize that he was the same offender so then how I mean did it just come out before the article that it keep us the same? No, so uh, in 2000 uh, is when we got the DNA matches between the Southern California cases and the Northern California cases. And we're able to connect those cases uh, with ours and, and realizing that they were the same offender. Uh, back in uh, the, the 80s, um, there was a thought that the offender in Santa Barbara was, was our offender and that's where he had moved, but there was no way to uh, specifically tie him to that uh, because now he isn't leaving any witnesses. Is there take any, two more questions. Uh, I was just, uh, is there any link or is there any idea uh, what happened in the five years where he just sort of dropped off the map and I guess what has the success been of um, matching his MO to other crimes across the country, not just California? That's one question. Uh, okay. So um, we don't know where he was during those five years or, or what was going on in his life. But we've seen from other serial offenders, uh, he may have had uh, uh, a child. Um, he could have been incarcerated. Uh, something happened in his life that caused that, that five-year gap. We've seen with uh, cases like BTK where there was, I, I believe it was a 16-year gap uh, before he was eventually caught. So um, we know that that they can stop for at least a period of time based upon what's going on uh, in their life. And it may have been a forced stoppage by being in custody. And then I can't remember the second part of your question. Uh, just the, uh, the linking of the MO to other uh, crimes across the country. So um, as part of our collaboration with the FBI, uh, obviously FBI has VICAP. And um, we have entered those uh, uh, cases into that in an attempt to link them to cases throughout the country. Uh, uh, every agency has the opportunity to uh, become a VICAP member, uh, and I believe it's a violent uh, criminal apprehension program, where you add all the MO uh, uh, information from your cases, and then uh, that provides you with uh, assistance in linking cases throughout the United States. If he was arrested today, would there be any kind of automatic 
notification that from his DNA being matched, and if so, how far would that go back? Uh, it would. Uh, so there is no statute on, on murder, and his uh, profile is in our state database. Uh, if we do receive a match, uh, then uh, agencies would be notified, and that would go back for all of his murders. I mean, how far back would you know that he hasn't committed a crime in which his DNA has been in the system that would have created this notification? Uh, so. Um, I, I think I understand your question in, in, in the sense of uh, as long as they've been collecting DNA and, and uploading that from various cases, um, we have not received an additional hit to, to show that. So if, if he were to offend today uh, and leave DNA at the scene, we would now know about a new case. Uh, but so far, we have not received any of that. How old he would have been in those various pictures? Uh, 18, 20, 25 uh, in that range. I think now he would be anywhere from uh, 60 to 75 years old. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Uh, this and the product has gone live now on FBI.gov slash Sacramento. So you'll find an entire suite of electronic products, including the sketches are in electronic form, the maps, there's even an animation that shows the counties which he hit in sequence. So there's a lot of goodies for you online. Do you have a Spanish speaker? No. 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 Sorry. Uh, but again, I want to thank you all for coming today and also the representatives of the different agencies, uh, especially here in, in uh, Northern California. So this will conclude the press conference for today. Thank you.